We're ready to have Ted present his program. Uh, are you open for questions during the program, after the program, At, or anytime? Anytime. Okay. You can ask questions now if you like. I mean. <laughs> and this program lasts about an hour or so? Uh, probably about an hour, yeah. All right. Any questions? Anything else? Let's get started. Rosalie, you're not buying any more tickets tonight. Rosalie wins every. I don't have one. Uh, okay, she wins every year. She wins every time. She's <laughs> Thank you all very much, Ted Baird. Thank you. Okay, uh, as he said, my name is Ted Baird. I'm the treasurer of the, the Francis Dorrance chapter of the Society for Pennsylvania Archaeology. It's a, a big name for a very small group of people. Uh, the Society for Pennsylvania Archaeology, the, the main offices and all generally tend to be out in western Pennsylvania uh, and the Pittsburgh area. Uh, but there's chapters all over the state. There's one down around, uh, down around um, Delaware Water Gap. Uh, there's some out in central Pennsylvania. So there's, there's groups all over. We have to say that we're, we're very proud of our group because we have uh, an archeological site that the, we've been working on for a good 20 years. And it's the Conrail site called Conrail site because it's on the old Conrail rail yard property. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. The site number is 36LU169. And people say, well, what is, what's that mean? 36 is Pennsylvania, alphabetic listing that's worth 36 in the in the country lu means luzerne county and 169 is where the 169th registered site in luzerne county so that's the designation that we use on all the paperwork we do and just like genealogists paperwork is important and doing it right is important uh, you have all uh, levels of of people that are interested in archaeology you have the people that walk the riverbanks and pick up anything they happen to find. You have the people that walk uh, plowed fields. You have people that, that we don't particularly approve of that just go into an area and dig a hole hoping to find something because nothing is recorded then. What we want to do is record everything, where we find it, how we find it, exactly where it was, not just, you know, two, 200 meters from this place and 300 meters from that place were more interested in it, that distance on a grid and how deep it might be. The Conrail site, usually people say, why did you decide to, to dig there? It's not just because somebody says, hey, you can dig here if you want. Uh, the Lackawanna River meets the Susquehanna River just about a mile below where the Coxton rail site is, the Conrail. Uh, it's in Coxton Yards, and uh, there used to be a farm that covered that whole mile area, and in historic times, there's a historic res uh, records of an Indian village called Asarugni. And even as, as early as, the, or as late as the mid-1800s after rains, it wouldn't be unusual for kids to go through that farm field, the Cremard farm, and find long bones from burials. And they'd march through the street drumming with these long bones. So it was a definite native village there at the, the site. The Conrail site is very unusual in that it's been protected by the railroad. You don't think of the, of the railroad as protecting something, but them being there kept it from being developed. It's a beautiful spot. It's a beautiful spot. It's right below Campbell's Ledge. Anybody familiar with Campbell's Ledge knows it's a, it's a beautiful area. There's uh, Scoville's Island out in the middle of the Susquehanna River. There's boats going up and down all the time. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Perfect place for a development. But the railroad being there kept it from being developed. And as a result, everything that was there is in the layers that it was either lost or thrown away and then covered by debris over the year. years, uh, flooding episodes, 
just leaf litter falling and, and decaying. So we have a chronological record of everything that was there. What caused them to, to pick that spot was one of the people I said people walk the rivers looking for these, uh, these uh, artifacts, which when I first started with this, with the group, I'd never known that it was so easy, relatively easy, to find things along riverbanks. But it's, I, I know some people that go out every time they go out and walk the river banks, they find stuff. And it's not always something very obvious, but it's always something. Um, but somebody walking along the river, they found a Clovis point. Anybody familiar with archaeology knows that the Clovis point is recognized as being about the oldest kind of point made in the Americas. Now I say a point, I don't say an arrowhead. And every time we talk about what most people think of, of as arrowheads, our, the archaeologists don't call it that. Because if you find something made out of stone that, that's that long and it comes in a point, it looks like it would go on there, could be a spear, could be a knife, could be a scraper, could be all sorts of things. So we don't call it an arrowhead, we call it a point because we don't know the exact use it may have been, been used for. Now there's going to be some pictures later on showing some of the artifacts that we found. Some of them are more obviously spear points, some of them are more obviously uh, more likely arrowheads, some of them are more obviously knives, just the way they're shaped. Um, the the um, spear points tend to be bigger, of course. The arrowheads are usually real tiny things. And we know that, that as far back as we go in the, in the archaeological record, the bow and arrow wasn't even used in the, the Americas at that time. So we know that they're not arrowheads, a lot of them. What they used, does anybody know what they used before they used a bow and arrow? Spears. Spears. You know how they threw the spears? They used an atlatl. Anybody ever hear of atlatls? Uh, there is an atlatl hunting season in Pennsylvania, believe it or not. Uh, two, uh, two people that are into archaeology petitioned the game commission to allow hunting with atlatls. What it is, is it's a, it's a stick, usually with a weight on it, notched on this end, and you'd hold, the, hold it up like this, it would stick back this way, you would rest the spear on that, and it gives you an extra elbow when you throw. Those things are extremely powerful. Well, anyway, they found a Clovis point just below where we're digging. They moved up onto the terrace, they approached uh, Conrail and said, is there any way we can dig there? They have been, and not just them, it's because it's changed hands now, it's the uh, Northern and Blue Mountain Railroad owns it. All along, they let us rent that piece of property that we're digging on for $10 a year. It cost about three times as much to insure it, but uh, it's $10 a year. But let's get into the slides. The, when we first started out, about 20 years ago, uh, this is what the first hole looked like. And you can see the different layers in the soil. Up on the top, there's a, a, a band about, oh, maybe an inch thick that was the Agnes flood. And that's about how much is, is deposited by a major flood and it gradually gets compressed. Then you can see that dark band all around there. That's all railroad debris. You have to really get through that in order to get to the Native American stuff, but we still check everything out there because it could be mixed in with the stuff from the surface at the time that it was laid down. And we're interested in the railroad history too. We're interested in the whole history of the place. Now what they're doing here, and OSHA would have had a fit, uh, is they're trying to get an idea of just how deep artifacts went in this area. So they, they were digging, oh, it looks like a, a three meter by three meter square, and they went down about 20 feet. No shoring, anything like that, all with shovels. Uh, they're very, very straight walls, 
were very, very particular about having straight walls. They went down about 20 feet. At about eight feet, artifacts disappear. They don't, they're not there anymore. But you dig down to the bottom just to see what all the soils look like. So any digging from that point on, you pretty well have a reference point. So that's what- Water, are you good at this? Uh, well, we, we th they dug down to where they hit river cobble, and then at that point, water starts seeping in. And we do have something later on that, that shows a little bit about the water. But funny thing is, even when we have heavy rains, because of a thick, thick layer of sand, which you'll see probably in the next slide or two, it disappears very, very quickly. Is that on the roof, that hole right there? At that time, it wasn't. At that time, it wasn't. This is a, a picture of a feature. Now, a feature, you're, you're in an alluvial plain. Rocks don't show up there normally on their own. They're, they're what they call manuports. Somebody had to bring them there. So anytime you find a cluster of rocks, it's significant. This is a cluster of rocks you can see is also stained with charcoal, which means somebody had a fire there. We pretty well determined what was going on in this area. Uh, it wasn't a place where people lived year round, or it doesn't appear to be. If you notice up there, there it says Conrail site, feature 12, very early on in the dig. Always have an arrow that points north. If, you're, if you don't have an arrow with you, you use a trowel to point north. That's just a standard convention so everybody knows what you're doing. Um, we dig in meter by meter squares and we go down 10 centimeters at a time so you can control everything and you know where, where you found stuff. But this is a, is a, a rock-lined pit and it's, it's one of many, many, many rock line pits that we find. Uh, most of the things we find are not points. Most of the things we find are features or pits, storage pits, um, things that were obviously put together by man. Can you tell the age? By the charcoal. By the, the yeah, we, we do. I don't know how old this one is, is here. Uh, I would have to look back in the, in the records. We do have a point that we have dated. The oldest point that we've actually dated is 7500 BPE, before the present era. As archaeologists, we don't get into AD, BC, because you might have you might have a, a Muslim archaeologist, you could have a Jewish archaeologist, you could have a uh, atheist archaeologist, it's, it's the same thing as AD and BC, but they've decided to call it before the current epic, which is about 2000, uh, 2100, 15 years ago <laughs> is when it started. But we, we've, so the, the site that we've, the, the oldest point that we've found so far is about 9,500 years old. That's about as old as you can get in the valley here. And I'll, I'll show you that when, they, when we show you the soil involved, you'll see why. This is how it looked originally. As you see, no cover. Uh, in beautiful spring weather, that's not a bad way to work. Only beautiful spring weather only lasts during a few weeks in the spring. Uh, late fall, it's not bad. But uh, you start getting the sun beating down on you while you're, while you're doing that, it gets pretty darn hot pretty darn fast. Uh, but you can see how, how small that was. That hole went down 20 feet and they were very glad to get out of it because they were getting nervous. Uh, the guy on the right, he's the president of our chapter. Uh, there's a, a group of volunteers. You can see we put up a port there, and it's made out of uh, furring strips, PVC pipe, and, and plastic. If you think that's cooler, <laughs> it keeps you from getting wet when it rains, but it's, it's essentially a greenhouse. So, uh,
they, just, they decided to keep it a blue tarp over it for most of the time. Uh, raise, they've, we've rebuilt it many times so that you can raise the side to get cross breezes. But you can't leave the blue tarp like one of those, like, like they cover houses when they're tearing off a roof or something. You can't leave the blue tarp on there because it, it makes it harder to see the features, the, colored, the color of the soil, and the color of the soil becomes very important. This is our, our sifters, they're set up. They were, these sifters were set up when we were all considerably younger. Uh, right now, it would be up maybe about three more feet so you wouldn't have to bend over to shake it. Uh, it's a learning process. But every, every bit of dirt that comes out of a square that we do is sifted. Now normally, you don't want to find anything in the sifter. The sifter's just a, sort of a safety net. You want to find it while you're digging because if it's something significant, you want to be able to record where it was. If you find a point, then you want to be able to say how many uh, centimeters it is from each, the, each of two sides and how deep it was. Because that's where you really get the information. Uh, I mean, that's, that's how you're... Archaeology is a destructive process. You can't undo it, okay? So you make as, as good a, a record as you can of where everything was. So the professional archaeologists, who the, 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 our president is one, they have programs where they can put all these plotted points in and reconstruct it on paper. But everything, as I said, is, is sifted, and, and if you do find something in the sifter, it's, uh, it's, you try to, as best you can, figure out where it came from. Usually you're digging, most people think of digging uh, with paint brushes and all that sort of stuff. That's not what really happens. Occasionally you'll, you'll use a trowel with a sharpened edge. Most of the time we're using flat shovels with a sharpened edge. And it's amazing when you're taking off a thin layer and, and it's soil like this, that's alluvial soil, you hear a click, you stop right away and you, you get down on your knees and then you use brushes and, and, uh, and trowels. Uh, these are some of our early members working on that same area. This, I, what, I, what I did with this picture is, it's a picture that was taken of the different layers of soil that were found on the wall. And that's part of the, our record keeping is after you've finished a large area, you map the wall to see where the different layers of soil go. You can see the top layer is very, fairly obvious. I used pow, uh, um, Photoshop and I outlined it so it would be a little bit more obvious for this picture. But if you notice down here, this really light band, that's a band of sand. And it's probably about two and a half feet deep. That's a single flood episode, probably about nine to 10,000 years ago. What they, what they think, we, we have, uh, occasionally we'll have a, a, um, a soil guy come out, Dr. Vento, and he'll look at, at the soils and, and sort of describe what happened. He said, more than likely, uh, you all know the Archibald pothole, right? Because we had glaciers a mile high on the northern part of the mountain. Well, same, same way there. And there was a glacial lake that burst open. And, and it flooded the whole valley. And that's probably why we don't find anything earlier than about nine, 10,000 years old. Because there was a huge flood that wiped everything clean. And we, we don't find any artifacts, or we've never found any artifacts below that sand la layer. Doesn't mean we don't look for it. When we get to the sand layer, we clear the sand out we usually sift every third or fourth bucket 
just to make sure that there's nothing that we're missing. And then when we get down to the bottom, we do test pits periodically around it to make sure that there's nothing that, we, that we've missed. How deep is that? Uh, that there is about, it's about six, maybe seven feet when you run into the sands. The, the, the layers are very, very thin and, and uh, uh, there's, you'll see layers of different kinds of soil, but it's not because it was all put down at one time, but it, that, that type of soil was all put down at one time over, over, over a period of time. A yeah. Oh, oh, it is pretty tight. Now, over the winter, when you get frost heave, you have to straighten out the walls and, and get everything correct. You usually take anything that's fallen off the walls, sift through that to make sure you're not missing an artifact or anything there. Okay, showing that we have uh, young people working there. We have uh, scout groups that come. We have students from, we've had students from Wyoming Seminary. We've had students from a Jewish school in Pittston. We've had students from uh, a couple of different places that have come, usually like accelerated programs. Uh, but anybody's welcome any day, anytime we're there. We're there uh, every Sunday from just about 10 o'clock to about three o'clock and we, we work that whole time. And anybody that, that comes there is welcome to, to join in or just watch whatever they want to do. Uh, but we, we want people to learn about the archaeology of the air area because we want people to realize that the archaeology is important. Um, this is another feature that we found. This is an instance where the, the trowel is being used as a north indicator. And that, if you notice, it doesn't have much charcoal. But if you look really close, you can see small outline like through here. And you have to sort of map that in on the floor and, and, and figure out where the soil changes. And the soil changes are very, very subtle. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we start digging a layer, we have to, we have to uh, take a Munsell book, which has soil colors and match up what color it starts out as and what color it ends up as. And, and they're very, as I said, very subtle changes a lot of times. Uh, this is one of our members. Worked at Scranton Lace, as a matter of fact. He was uh, one of those machine operators at Scranton Lace. But he's doing some experimental archaeology there. He's, uh, he's making a rock line pit so that we could see what one would have looked like when it was, when it was new. We've, we've seen a lot of them that were uh, old, stones moved around and everything, but we wanted to get an idea of what they, they looked like when they were fresh, and he's just doing that as sort of an experiment. This is our first of, of several vandalisms. Uh, as you know, whenever you're doing anything nice, some people, it makes some people unhappy for some reason. And this is, this is one of those times uh, somebody put accelerant on there and burned up our, our tar tarp and our plastic. We've had other times where people have taken uh, rebar and thrown it through the plastic. Uh, this year we're, we're dealing with kids, kids, adults, fishermen, because we, we know where the wood is gone taking our scrap wood and burning it for fires at, for fishing at night. So it's, it's always a struggle. <laughs> this is where the, where the dig is located. The distance there is West Pittston. On that side of the river is, is regular Pittston. This is the uh, Coxton Yards, Conrail Yards. The where, area where the water is, is the Cremard Farm. And you say, there's water there. How could that be a farm? Well, they've mined topsoil out of there. And there are some people that have bought topsoil from that location. They have no idea what, there's some, probably some very beautiful artifacts, stone artifacts in people's topsoil. Uh, 
we, we, the west side of the river? This is the east side of the river. That's Scoville's Island in the middle, uh, West Pittston on the far side, and this is the, this is taken from Campbell's Ledge. Okay. This, the picture was taken from Campbell's Ledge. Um, but the, the, the topsoil was mined from there, and now um, the Lackawanna River Authority, I think, is, has control over it, which is, is nice. Uh, there's an area down towards the mouth of the Lackawanna that, that's much in much better shape than that, that area there that's flooded. Uh, just about in that area is where we're digging. Uh, we're currently right about there. <laughs> but um, the, we have some old pictures that, that I'll, I'll show you a little bit later of, of that whole area. Um, there used to be a rail spur that ran up to just about where we are digging. So it, it's, there's some disturbance in that area, but not a heck of a lot. But that area where the water is, 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 uh, is where that farm was that, that there used to be a village in, on that farm site. Uh, we were f fortunate in that the guys running the heavy machinery over there knew our, our, the president of our group and if they came across something, if they scraped something off and they saw it was something significant, they'd give him a call and he'd have to do some uh, uh, archaeology late in the evening after his day's work just to, to sort of uh, recover the things that were going to be ir irretrievably lost. This is a picture taken from the road and from our site across over to the west side of the, the Susquehanna River. That's a picture of Campbell's Ledge with a, a mustached gentleman there. He's our president. He, they, there's a awful, it's, it's not just digging. There's an awful lot of research that goes along with the archaeology because you want it to match up with, with the historic record also. And, and part of what they wanted to do is get an idea of what it looked like from the top. He's probably the one that took that picture of, of the, the site area. This is a feature here, and it's been half dug out, okay? It was a charcoal stain, or a stain in the ground, and it's not just charcoal, it's charcoal and oils. And what we do is we divide it in half, and take out half of it so you can see it in a profile. It gives you an idea of, of the depth, what it was used for. This was probably uh, a, a pit where they, they were processing nuts. And pretty well, that's what we've decided what they did here most of the time was they would come here in the fall to process nuts. They would take harvest nuts from the, the land around there and boil them down for the oils sort of like Native American peanut butter kind of a thing uh, because they had, it's loaded with fats and they needed it for their diets to make it through the winters. Uh, we found uh, nutshells in most of these pits and, and the soil is a little bit oily. So uh, located where it is, we, we thought we'd be finding a lot of uh, associated with fishing, but almost every single one of the pits is loaded with nutshell. Hickory, black walnut, mostly. I, I imagine acorns, you know, acorns, while they're not very good, you wouldn't want to pop one in your mouth if they're, if they're processed right, they're, they're, the oils from them are good. This is the Susquehanna River taken from the, the river bank. It's rather wide there, you can see, and uh, it's rather high there too because that was during one of our many, many floods. Uh, this is also the Susquehanna River along the road where our, the access is. 
If you look in the distance beyond this row of trees, you can see the Susquehanna River. Um, there have been floods that have covered our dig site in eight foot of water. And you would think that that would be devastating, but usually we can have it cleaned up in two weeks. Um, Ivan deposited about, oh, maybe two and a half, three inches of mud. You take a trowel, slice it like fudge, pick it up, everything that was underneath it is clean as a whistle. Stinks though. <laughs> This is a, a rather extensive rock pit. Uh, and it, exactly what it's used for. But what's interesting about this, and what I wanted to point out with this picture is, we didn't find them like that. They were covered with dirt. But when you take a picture of it, you have to clean out all the dirt from around all of those stones. And then you have to draw it in, which is not much fun. And then you have to photograph it and, and uh, but it has to be that clean to really get a good idea of, of, of what, it, what it is. And then when you disassemble it, because you have to disassemble it because you're going to dig underneath it, you have to look at each and every one of those rocks to see if it was used for something. Because a lot of the rocks were used before, before they, they didn't, you didn't go down to the river to get another rock if you had a rock handy. Yeah. And you people, a lot of people ask, how do you know where a good site for a Native American? Okay, anybody here ever gone camping? Yeah, a good campsite is a good campsite. And it's the same, same back then. People have used this same piece of land for a long time because it's, it's loaded with everything you want. It's near water. Uh, a lot of people look at a, a rock shelter up on a hill and say, oh, they had to have been used by the Native Americans. It was too far from the water, it wasn't. If it faced north, it wasn't. It was too wet. So it had to have very, very particular things in order for it to be something they would want to use. Now, they might have used a, a rock shelter for a short period of time. If they're hunting a thunderstorm, they duck into one. But, you know, to use it for extensive period, uh, periods of time, it had to have the right conditions, south facing, uh, good overhang, near water. This is us fixing that uh, rickety uh, shelter in the springtime, which we did every spring because the snow would collapse it. And this is just one of the many, many times that we rebuilt the thing. and. Uh, Fortunately, one of our members worked for Procter & Gamble, which is just uh, north of our site, and he got a grant so we were able to buy a frame for a greenhouse. And that's what we've been using uh, at least in the last 10 years. This is a cache of blades. Uh, and this, they are exactly where they found it. Uh, in between two, two different units and cleaned up, kept in place until they took the, the photos and then uh, taken out. And you can only see two there, but this is what they look like when they're, they've been taken out and cleaned. And by cleaned, I don't mean cleaned in water. They're just brushed off. Anytime you find a point, you don't, you don't clean it with water because you could be walk, washing off residue. Believe it or not, these points here, they, could, they can find blood residue from animals they may have been used to, to kill. This is a, a very, very good uh, pit, and that would have been the residue from nut. If you notice all the black in there, we, we collect all the carbon, this is after all the, the majority of the carbon is taken out. When, when you are digging a pit, you want to leave some of the residue on the outside and some of the undisturbed soil so you get, have a better idea of where the two met. So you sort of stop digging when you start getting this modeled appearance. 
And again, that one's been done in profile, and now it's had the second half of it taken out. Uh, again, rickety uh, buildings and snow. And we dig usually up until mid-December when the ground starts to freeze. Once the ground starts to freeze, it's practically useless to do it. It takes too long for everything to thaw out so you can sift the dirt. We usually start in the spring around April when we're able and we go down there to clean up, get everything ready so that as soon as the frost is out of the ground, we're digging and, and, and sifting. Okay, here again, they're, they're working on, here is an instance where they're using a trowel. You can see the flat shovel behind the young lady there. Uh, and we're sitting on rugs. You do not want to be, you don't want your feet resting in the soil because you're, you're, each time you move your, your toes or your heels, you're scraping dirt that may be hiding something that we, we want to protect. So a lot of the work we do is on, was on rugs. We'd get samples from a uh, rug dealer. Uh, you know, one of the places that put down the carpeting, we get their, their old samples. Now we've, we've now have rubber mats like you can get at, uh, at Sam's Club or, or Home Depot or something like that. And it, it helps protect the floor. There, are, there is one site out in western Pennsylvania, Meadowcroft. Has anybody ever hear of Meadowcroft? Uh, Dr. Adavazio there. He's digging in very, very old soils in an old rock shelter. And he's, he's using students from Mercyhurst College. They have to be in there in their, in their bare feet or sock feet. And, and they only dig with trowels, sometimes with razor blades. I mean, they, they don't want to take, because the layers between different ages there are so thin that, and it's a very significant site because it shows that Clovis people were this far east very, very early. Uh, there, you, can, you can go and visit it sometimes. It's near a, uh, like a farm museum uh, just outside of Pittsburgh. That hole's a lot. Three feet deep then? Uh, yeah, just about three feet. Maybe. It's all done by the shovels? All, everything is done by the shovels. The only time we use uh, equipment, heavy equipment, is when we're clearing the site to put, put down the, the, um, the cover. And then we, they only scrape off to level it off, and it's usually the railroad debris, and that is piled up. I'll tell you, I spent half of one summer just cleaning up a pile of the stuff that was scraped off. How long did that hold up? Oh, let's see. That's a lot of shovels full. That's a lot of shovels full. That's probably uh, maybe a year, year and a half's worth of work, depending on how many people come out. We have a handful, maybe eight people come regularly. There's been times when we've had more people at a time. Uh, we never mind seeing the scouts come, especially if their uh, leader is a whip cracker. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we uh, occasionally we'll have scout groups, and if you have a, a, a scout leader that cracks the whip a little bit, it's, a, it's nicer to, you get a lot of sifting done by, by 12 year olds. They, they like to sift. This is a cache of, of projectile points. And this one, you see it's uneven. That is very possibly a blade of a knife. Uh, this one is probably a, a blade of a knife because of its irregularity. Uh, that one is probably a spear point or arrowhead, as is that one. The ones on that side are, are sort of uh, your guess is as good as mine kind of thing. This is a large rock that was found in one of the features. Uh, a lot of times you'll find large rocks and if you look at them closely it'll be pitted in the center and this is probably one of those rocks and it would be what is called a nutting stone. You have a big rock, you put a nut on it, you crack it with another rock after you've 
hit it with another rock so many times that it eventually gets a depression in it that, that will sort of hold the, the nut for you. Uh, you see that's feature 69. We are up to feature 437. That's to show that I was young once. <laughs> Yeah, don't you remember? You used to smile like that when you were young. Yeah, yeah, you never saw it because I wasn't at work when I smiled like that. <laughs> See, I always liked going there. My wife couldn't understand it. She doesn't understand me liking to do heavy manual labor for no pay. But the excitement of finding things is, is so, so much. This is a, another one. This is another feature showing a rock cluster in the bottom. There was one that I found that had about 30 what they call preforms. They, the Native Americans would, would bring rocks from these quarries as far away from as Allentown. They would bring some of these, these rocks. And if they weren't able to make them into points right away, they would bury them on the bottom of the pit or put them on the bottom of the pit to heat treat them because it would make the stone harder. And I happened to find one that they, they, they did and forgot about. What and kind of stone did they use? Chert, which is like native flint. That usually comes from upstate New York. They find it along the river. The stuff from Allentown is jasper. Anybody, if they go down the northeast extension of the turnpike, you know where Vera Cruz is? Yeah. Well, if you look up to the left, the quarry for the jasper is right up there. This was not vandalism. This was nature's uh, revenge. Uh, this is why we're glad that we have a greenhouse frame now, because every spring, we would end up completely rebuilding the, we, you can see we have the insulation down there, that's how we kept the, the floors from heaving, uh, but almost every year it would uh, collapse, we'd have to wait for the snow to melt out of the center and then we'd rebuild it. Uh, up behind the trees there is Campbell's Ledge, that's where Campbell's Ledge is in, this, in comparison to us. This, you can see, we measure everything in centimeters. Uh, so that one is about, let's see, 12 centimeters long, about five to six inches long. It is the largest of that style point found on, along the Susquehanna this far up. Uh, the State Museum was very interested in this one. It is absolutely beautiful. You, you see the material it's made of. It has, it, it's probably jasper there, but it's a mixed jasper. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, point. Now, not just Native American stuff we find there. This is a picture from the 1850s. That's Campbell's Ledge up behind that little, little house picture's probably taken from Scoville's Island, and that's approximately where our dig is. We think it's the same spot where we found two other buildings at different times. That property was originally uh, granted to John Phillips from, he was from Rhode Island, but he came in with the Connecticut people. Anybody familiar with this area knows that there was uh, the Yankee Pennamite Wars, the Connecticut people claimed this whole area for, for, for Connecticut, and the Pennsylvania people weren't too happy about it. Native Americans were not too happy about it because the Pennsylvania, w w the Pennsylvania proprietors were keeping people out of this area. Uh, the Connecticut people had the, uh, the good Yankee sense <laughs> to go up into upstate New York where the, uh, the Iroquois nation was, uh, get a few choice chiefs drunk and got them to sign some papers for a little bit of money. It's pretty well what happened. And they moved into this area uh, just 
just above uh, where the Lackawanna meets the Susquehanna. John Phillips bought the, or had the grant. His father had the original grant. He sold it to his son. And then his son said, you can live on it here for the rest of your life because, Dad, I like you. Uh, John Phillips owned 1,300 acres between the, the Susquehanna River and what is now Old Forge in, on that side of the river. So he, he owned extensive land. What happened to John Phillips is he, he joined the Revolutionary War, went back to Rhode Island. He's one of the Green Mountain Boys. He came back to his farm, settled in, and the Connecticut people and the Pennsylvania people were still fighting over who owned it. George Washington said, we got to get this settled. They had the, uh, the uh, decision was made in Trenton, New Jersey, that it belonged to Pennsylvania. And the decision was, but the people that are there just have to say they're Pennsylvanians instead of people from Connecticut. Well, the Pennsylvania people didn't think that was a good idea. So they sent their troops and chased them out and burned the place down. All the stuff. Uh, John Phillips had good enough sense to eventually get a charter through Pennsylvania for the same land that he, he owned. What they were doing is if there was a Pennsylvania owner that claimed it, they'd chase the people out. If nobody wanted it from Pennsylvania, then they would uh, uh, pretty well leave the Connecticut people alone. Or the Rhode Island people, New Englanders. Uh, what, what he did is he, he got the land back. He eventually gave the land to his two sons. North of that house is uh, John Sylvania. He wasn't vain at all. He didn't want to name a place after him. John Phillips named a part of it John Sylvania. The area where we're looking at now was Phillipsville. Uh, so he got his name in there for at least for a, a portion of time. Uh, but he gave it to his sons and he moved up to Dalton because he was tired of having his fences washed away. This is a stereo slide of, and that picture should look familiar because that's taken just about from the same spot on Campbell's leg. There is a building there, and that's a blow up of that building. This is the old North Branch Canal. This is all before railroads. And we, we believe that we found part of the foundation for that structure there, along with, in this picture, to the far left, there is a house just along the river's edge there that you can just barely see. It doesn't look a heck of a lot different today other than the rail yards being in better shape. The roundhouse is, is half burned down. That uh, trestle that runs off to the left, it looks like a coal pocket, that's gone. The bridge still crosses the Susquehanna. Anybody that's ever gone fishing there knows that the last couple of floods have really done a job on that. The man that owns it, I think every now and then he shows up in the, the news that he's being fined or being told he has to tear it down. But those, those structures are still standing. What kind of bridge is there? Rail bridge. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the rail bridge that, that connected Coxton Yards to the, to, to the rest of the Lehigh Valley Railroad. Yeah. Yeah. Along the river. Would that be 92, present day 92? Uh, that's the one that goes up through Harding? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's 92. And there's a, uh, I think a brewery over there. There was a brewery at one time and... Uh, is that farmhouses up on... Uh, yeah, farmhouses. And if you look at Scoville's Island, yeah. you notice that that's all farm too. Yeah, there's, there's, I've seen pictures of Scoville's Island where you can see buildings on... Uh, Are those on buildings the, still there up on Camels or not? I haven't. That's not Campbell's Lake. That's the the other side of the river. But I, I don't know. I imagine there's there's remnants of them there. But the house over to the left is the foundation that we found. That's a close up. I, I photoshopped that and blew it up. That is the house that we initially found the foundation for. While we were doing the Native American dig, we came across the corner 
the left front corner of that building and I've spent the last five years digging it out. We, we figure that that house there appeared sometime probably from in 1870s and it was gone by 1917 because the railroad map from 1917 which were very detailed doesn't show a, a, a structure there. Not to say that they didn't use the the foundation because we know that they did. This is the inside of the foundation of that house. Now the basement didn't, wasn't the whole house. There's rock over on the right hand side that, that completed the foundation. But you can see this level here, up on the top, there's a, a, a very rough stone wall built in the middle and then there's a, a layer of very, very dark coal looking stuff. We've, we know that that was put in in the 1930s. The reason we know that it was put there in there in the 1930s, it was, that was under a layer of concrete and underneath the concrete we found a dog license from the 1930s. So we know that the, the railroad probably reused that foundation at some point. The part closest to us in this picture was completely filled in with, with tumbled in rocks and, and debris. Is that stairs on the back? And that's the, the cellar steps, yes. That's it after the, the, the rest of that debris has been taken out. And that's what, that's what it looked like about three years ago before we started getting the ice heave and that the wall on your right hand side is starting to tilt dangerously. And the wall right in front of us, we dug behind that to see the builder's trench because a builder's trench is valuable for giving dates on a place because when you're building a house, where do you throw your junk? On the side where nobody's going to see it. So we, we, we dug out the builder's trench on the outside and that wall has since collapsed on us. Um, we did early on at the very top of that builder's trench, we found a Civil War era medicine bottle in pieces, but I've glued most of it together. Uh, it's one of the crazy things my wife uh, thinks I've lost my mind. I, I uh, use Elmer's glue to put together broken bottles. And then a really, really nice uh, earthenware jar from that. Uh, a couple of views of the house. That's looking west towards the river. That's the wall that's heaving. On the other side of the wall, it was all filled in with rock. And it's like two and a half, three foot of rock on the other side of that wall to make a, a probably a vapor barrier of, of sorts to, for under the rest of the house. To the, to the left of that wall, right about where you see the bottom step there, there's another foundation that was dug into when they built this foundation. And I think it's that, that middle picture that I showed you from that middle building. That's my guess at anyway right now. This is looking uh, north. And you gotta, gotta look at that and, and realize that where, the, where the, the ground is up there, where the grass is growing, that was completely flat. There was no indication that was there at all. It was only by chance that we happened to come across the corner of the foundation. It was all filled in level with the tops of the wall. It was all filled in. Then, that's the east wall with, with that little divider wall still in there and my shadow there. I saw my shadow so we had three more weeks of winter. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the things that we found and some of the more interesting uh, things. Coins are always fun to find because they have dates on them, okay? And we have a one dime, those, that's the one in the center. We have a five cent piece down in the lower left hand corner. The top ones are large cents. And then we have in the middle on the bottom coins that have been drilled. And they're almost always drilled on one side. It's not like drilled in the center where they might use it as a button or something like that. It's drilled like that. The best ex explanation I've gotten for why they did that. Necklace, necklace or 
a lot of times the, the guys didn't have pockets and they'd string their money and put it down in their pants, which, which wouldn't thrill me if I were a merchant, but that's okay. Uh, and the one on the right is a miner's tag. So we know that there was a coal miner lived there because we didn't just find one miner's tag, we found four, three or four miner's tags, all with the same number, 803, Lehigh Valley uh, Coal Company. So th that's the sort of thing that gives you tidbits of information. One thing that we d coin that we found this uh, just last year at the end of the year. Anybody here watch Diggers? A recent episode of Diggers, the, the one guy got all excited. He gets excited anyway. Uh, got excited because he found a three cent piece. Well, we found a three cent piece earlier, 1853. And it's where we found it that made it neat. There, there's doll parts. What do doll parts tell you? There's kids there. There are kids there. Little girls. And we, this is just an example of that, that one in the middle is the creepiest doll face I've ever seen. And then ornamental stuff, bracelet. You can't tell whether that's a woman's or a man's bracelet. More than likely it was a woman's bracelet. Uh, there is a cleat for the bottom of somebody's boot. Those, that thing up in the center, we think they might have been like on a collar, a metal piece on a collar, a decorative piece. And then this one here, it's, it's not easy to see, but it's, it's a woman going like this and her hair is flowing down this way. Her face is there. Pieces of pipe, lots of pieces of pipe. Uh, clay pipes got broken very, very easily. Uh, a lot of them are marked with, with the initials TD on the part that would face the smoker. Uh, I believe his, that was Thomas Dougal. Uh, he was made a lot of pipes for America, made them in Scotland and sold them to the Americans. Uh, they usually had a tobacco leaf motif. We have one that looks like it's it's a man's face on the front of it. That's, that's about the, the most unusual one we found. Uh, buttons, some buttons can be dated, other buttons can't be. Uh, but if it's a flat button, you can look up on the internet and there's people that are experts on the manufacturer of buttons. And if you can find the, the maker's name. A clay marble up in the upper right hand corner. Again, an indication probably of a boy living in the house. We've also found harmonica parts, which is also an indication uh, that they like music. Uh, comb, they must have combed their hair. I, I used to have a comb. Uh, <laughs> but we've, we've also found, you did too? <laughs> we, but we found other ones that are Goodyear rubber combs that are lice combs. Yes, fine tooth combs for lice. Uh, there's an ornamental piece down there in the center. Off to the left, that's some sort of a plastic coated button. It was sort of like a political button, but we don't know what it was because it was so deteriorated when we got. The thing in the middle, anybody tell me what that, what that is? It's not a coin, it's lead. And it's flattened and it has a couple of holes in it and notches around the edge. Anybody, when they were a kid, ever take a button and put it on a string and go like this and that's, it's a wizard. Yeah, and, and the, the, the notches along the side are to make it, it took us, me a long time to figure out what it was and it wasn't until I was reading an article about an archeological dig in Berwick, in the Berwick area, that they had one almost exactly like. A kid would take a, a lead bullet, flatten it, poke holes in it and make himself a toy. Uh, pliers, little snips, uh, a gun flint up in the upper left hand corner and, and some of the gun flints are really really nice. They're made out of French flint and they're really really fine material. Shotgun shells. You might think, oh you find shotgun shells everywhere, but when you find them buried and you get the date, there is a guy in Canada has a website 
with all the different makers' marks of, of shells, and it gives the years that they were made. So you can determine when the, we, the shotgun shells were made, even the bullets were made. Uh, anybody know what's on the lower right-hand corner? Plate? No, no, it's, it's only about this big. It's a, it's a canning lid liner. And that's another thing that you can... Uh, yeah. Yeah, porcelain. And they would have a zinc top, and that would be inside. You'd put rubber rings around the, the can, or the, the lip of the... And, but the writing on the side tells you the company, and you can get an idea of when it was, when it was made by the company involved. This is what we found three years ago, when we were digging next to the foundation uh, for the... Um, Again, looking for Native American stuff. Down to about that level, and you can see the top where that, uh, that board is on the left-hand side. And we're down in there, this pile of rock is like this, and the president of our group said, Ted, move those rocks out of there, they're gonna fall on somebody. So I start pulling the rocks out, and I'm noticing dirt falling down between the rocks. And then I get a flashlight and shine it in, I can see the curved wall, of this well back in there. The three cent piece we found buried, oh, about four foot down on the outside of the well. And one thing that we determined by, by taking this well down, because we took the first, say, four feet down from the top, we determined that in order to build the well, they didn't just dig a hole and line it. They dug a hole three times bigger than they wanted the well to be, they lowered the rock down in, they cut the stone out in a curve and laid them up and backfilled. Yeah, and the well, goes, the, the well goes down well over 30, uh, 20 feet because last week was probably the last that we're gonna be working on the well because uh, one of our members was down in there with his hard hat and his ladder and his uh, post hole digger and he was uh, standing in 18 inches of water. Uh, so the water's starting to, to come back up into the well. Uh, and that's down at least 20 feet. And that's just a picture looking down in the well. What's really remarkable is each one of those stones, if you look at it, they're all cut in a curve. And each one of those stones had to have been brought there probably from Campbell's Ledge on a sledge or something like that. And we know it was built after 1853 because we found that three cent piece about four foot down in the outside of the well. And that's all I have. If you have any questions or anything? No? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Now I hit escape. I can find it. This isn't my computer, it's my wife's. All right. Do you have any contact information, a card or anything? My wife keeps telling me I should make a card, <laughs> but it's, it's oh yeah, my, my email address is tedbaird at verizon.net. B-A-I-R-D? B-A-I-R-D, B -A -I -R -D. B -A -I -R -D. yes. Uh, you did make a student, How do you know when to quit? <laughs> how, how deep, when we hit that sand layer, we go through the sand layer pretty quickly and then do test pits. We've never found anything below the sand layer, ever. Is this how Indiana Jones started? <laughs> no, Indiana Jones had a more exciting, uh, he, he found very valuable things and he got chased by people and we don't get chased. Uh, no. No, that, uh, matter of fact, none of us are chased down at the site. <laughs> oh, okay, that bad joke, but that's okay. Okay. Do you have a website too for that? There is a Facebook page okay, for uh, Francis Dorn's uh, chapter SPA. Uh, it's, it's our local one. Uh, Anybody planning on building a house, I also have plans for an out, uh, ice house. Uh, and, and I have all Ezra Ripple's glass slides from his presentation of his, his imprisonment at Andersonville. 
I, I did it for the Historic Society. I, I scanned those in for them because they, they anything with negatives and all, they, they'll they'll have me do it. Uh, have things in Moscow history too, because that's where I live. Anyway. <laughs> okay. You familiar with Ferris Pizza? Oh yeah. All the artifacts he has from going Yeah. Uh, what what I, I really like at Ferry's Pizza, and I'd love to have have a, a copy of it, is the picture hanging up there of the Aston Mountain Railroad. Yes. My grandfather, when he was uh, about 17 or 18, used to deliver mail uh, in a horse and buggy. And he uh, he was there and down in that area and there was a man walking across that bridge and a train coming and he thought for sure he was going to see an accident. The guy just lowered himself between the, the rails, hung from one of the ties until the train went over and then he picked himself up and continued his walk. Wise man. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Here's a question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Jim. Jim is our 